Tihei Moriora, Namehi Nui Kia Koto Katoa. It's wonderful to be here, and thank you, Kim, for that wonderful introduction. Very kind. Um, and it's wonderful to be here in support of uh, what is actually Brain Awareness Week, believe it, if you didn't know, it, it is. I mean, it, it occurs at different times during the year, but here in New Zealand, we're celebrating it this week. Um, and the Neurological Foundation has been a huge supporter of um, Brain Awareness Week. Um, you probably already know about the Neurological Foundation, but I can tell you it's a wonderful organization. I myself am a longtime donor to the foundation, but I also get my money back <laughs> from, <laughs> from grants, so it's a very good investment on my, on my behalf. Um, and we'll be talking about some of the research that is currently being funded um, uh, uh, on Alzheimer's uh, d disease work uh, with, with Jim and myself and others. So um, a big shout out to uh, the Neurological Foundation. <coughs> now, you probably know when I go outside, I have to wear a hat. And um, actually, I, I'm aware of many hats. And I just want to just explain a couple of the hats that, that I wear. I'm, a, I'm from the University of Otago. I'm in the psychology department. I've basically been there since 1981. So I'm almost as long a New Zealander as the Neurological Foundation has been going. Um, I'm not sure I'm yet considered a Kiwi, really, but I'm trying to get there. Um, so the, one, one hat is the, uh, the Brain Health Research Center, which is the University of Otago's effort to bring researchers together as a collaborative uh, organization to synergize research and to get people working more together, um, not just in Dunedin, but also in the Christchurch and Wellington Medical Schools. Um, but now, um, having formed that and moved on in a way, um, I'm now one of the co-leaders of the uh, Aotearoa Brain Project, Kopapa Roa or Aotearoa, um, which is trying to do the same thing across the country now to get the different centers working more together, to get training of students more organized in a way, um, to get more connected with communities, um, with Maori and Pacifica communities as well. Um, and so we're a, a nascent organization, but we're hopefully making some progress and can uh, keep getting funding to uh, keep going. But anyway, um, what we're here to talk about today is some progress, maybe, hopefully, um, in Alzheimer's disease research. And so Jim and I will be discussing that. So here is our, what I kind of like to visualize as going into the future, how we'd like to have like a nice, smooth tunnel of life into you know, a glistening future of retirement or however, probably some of you don't know the word retirement, but um, the, the, the future, there's a, the light at the end of the tunnel, uh, there's no kind of, um, you know, um, pr causes for disruptions and um, of course we think of health, this is a big issue. We don't necessarily need the men in high vis vests, but um, some road cones just to warn us that there are some dangers along the way we need to avoid and so forth. So like this would be, this could be a visualization of the ideal going forward. And, and of course in, in this talk, we're interested in um, the brain part. And um, so here's a picture of an actual brain. Um, I just grabbed it off the internet, but you know, this is what an, an actual brain looks like. Um, we're looking down on top of it. Um, the, the, the front of the brain, the front of the head is to the top and um, it doesn't show up. Um, and the back of the brain is at the bottom. And you can, uh, so you've probably seen pictures of the brain before. This is a nice healthy looking brain. It's got nice bulges. The gaps between the bulges are very thin and narrow. Um, and this is what we're looking at. It's called the cerebral cortex, which is one of the big thinking machines of the brain um, that we have in coordination with actually a lot of other things. So if we cut the brain in half, we just turn it sideways, um, <coughs> you can see that there's a lot of machinery inside the brain that you're probably not used to looking at, but uh, it's also very important um, for all our functions, um, including our vegetative functions, but also our higher functions as well. So it's a complicated machine. It's got approximately 80 billion nerve cells in there. No one's actually counted all the nerve cells in a single brain, but very strong estimates is around 80 billion. Um, so you can imagine that that's a lot of, that's a lot of uh, hardware. You might think of it in the computer terms. And even if you lost a bit of 
hardware. If you lose a bit of RAM out of your computer, the computer can still basically work just fine, right? Um, unless it has a really high demand task uh, in front of it, and that's just the way the brain works too. Um, yeah, so it's an amazing structure, and it's only, what, about two and a half kilos or so, uh, but it uses up 20% or 25, 20 to 25% of the cardiac output. So it's very thirsty for what it gets from your heart, right? So it's using way more than you would it'd expect from the size of, of the brain relative to the rest of the body. So obviously, it's very important structure. I think we all know that. And the heart knows it too, so it sends a lot of blood its way to bring all the nutrients and oxygen and so forth. So here's a, just a stain, a particular stain of nerve cells um, that are in the cerebral cortex part I just, I just showed you. And um, uh, it may look muddy to you, but it just looks beautiful to me. I mean, these nerve cells are fantastic. Um, and they have these processes going out that make lots of connections. And all this empty space you see in there is not empty by any stretch. It's just that this stain only picks up the occasional cells. But it, the nice thing about it is it means you can then see individual cells and how their processes go out and how they start to connect with each other. So <coughs> you got, like I say, you have 80 billion of these in a kind of society that works together. Different cells have different jobs, and they work together to produce the, all the behaviors and cognitions that we have. OK, so there's a challenge, though, because that tunnel isn't always the nice, smooth road to our happy future um, that uh, we would like it to be. And there occasionally will be blockages and disruptions that make life much, much more difficult. So Alzheimer's disease is, gosh, uh, one of the biggies. I think you're probably here because you also think that's the case. Um, first described by a um, German neurologist, Alois Alzheimer, in 1907. Um, and um, it's a form of dementia. Now, people often ask me, what's the difference between Alzheimer's disease and dementia? Well, dementia is basically an umbrella term for many s kinds of dementia, uh, and Alzheimer's disease is one kind of dementia. So that's just a subset of all dementias, but it's the single biggest subset, and probably 60, 70% of all dementias are of the Alzheimer's type. So um, uh, it's, it's one of the major um, neurological disorders. Typically, symptoms begin with mild memory complaints, or there, there can be other issues with regard to smell, to movements, fine control, and so forth, but people are particularly sensitive to mild memory complaints. Um, so there's a slow, insidious onset and, uh, and then progressive de deterioration as time goes by. And when, you're, when a person is alive, it's very difficult to be sure that a person has Alzheimer's disease. Um, uh, so basically, your, phys will, your physician will help run tests, they'll try to rule out everything else, and if everything else is ruled out, then it's probably Alzheimer's disease. Um, and really, you don't know for sure unless someone does post-mortem um, investigations of the brain after death. But in some ways, it doesn't matter because we don't have specific effective treatments for Alzheimer's disease. It can be useful to know a diagnosis or a probable diagnosis because it helps people understand, people around you understand uh, people's behavior and, and maybe some ideas of what to do about it. Um, but uh, yeah, it's typically we can't know for sure. There are some fancy scanning techniques that gives us more information that raises the probability to a much higher level, but they are not readily available um, and they're very costly. You've probably heard of PET scans. Is the Neaton Hospital going to get a PET scanner or not? You know, it's one of those big issues, um, but even if they did, they probably wouldn't be using it to try to diagnose Alzheimer's disease. I mean, there's lots of other reasons for having a PET scan. So um, uh, just so you know, um, September, lock it in, is World Alzheimer's Month. There's things that happen around New Zealand. Um, and if you want to know more about Alzheimer's disease, there's lots of good information on the internet. The Brain Health Research Center for example, I mentioned has information, the uh, Aotearoa Brain Project, 
uh, the Alzheimer's organization in the US and Alzheimer's New Zealand, they all have lots of information about Alzheimer's disease, information for caregivers, for patients, for families, for fauna and so forth. So there's lots, and uh, so I don't have time to go through all that, uh, but there's, there's lots of information on the internet. Okay, so <clears throat> it's a big problem. Um, we just heard that um, neurological disorders are more common than cancers and heart disease and so forth. So um, in the case of Alzheimer's disease, it goes on for so long. There's this insidious deterioration. Uh, people's memory, their personalities can change. There's, and it's a long, uh, drawn-out process for most people. So it's very distressing. So we need to do something about it. Because this is what it looks like. And talk about losing hardware. You know, the RAM capability of the brain goes down by as much as a third. Um, and you can see those nice fat gyri are now much thinner. The gaps between them are much wider. That's because neural tissue is being lost uh, in a big way by the time you get to kind of the late end stage, as you've seen on the, on the right-hand side. And I should point out, there's lots of other cell types in the brain besides nerve cells, okay? Um, and, and they are also affected by the disease. If you actually did look at a uh, Alzheimer's brain under the microscope, you would see these kinds of abnormalities in, in the pathology reports. Um, so we have, sorry, I'm just going to, going to put up a fancy laser pointer. Okay, so um, these are what are called plaques, so, uh, which contain um, a small protein called amyloid that are that appear in the um, outside cells and take up space and cause inflammation. Um, and also inside cells are what are known as tangles where another protein called tau becomes aggregated as well. They're, they're, in both cases, these proteins are insoluble so they can't be chewed up and thrown away with the waste. And so they aggregate and they become deadly and, and the tangles in particular are deadly for nerve cells. So they kill cells, they cause neuroinflammation which if you've ever had a twisted ankle or a repetitive strain injury, you'll be very familiar with inflammation. And generally, if it's short term, it's a good thing. But over a long period of time, inflammation actually turns the, um, the rescue systems on, on to the brain itself and makes things worse. So what are the big issues from a research perspective? There are many issues around Alzheimer's disease, one of them around caregiving, life for the people uh, being affected, but from a research perspective, what are the things, what are the big issues? Well, one is we would like to be able to delay the onset so that people live um, a better life for longer, if not completely prevent the onset altogether. Uh, we would like to also be able to detect it earlier. So, um, so the treatments that we have and, and maybe are hopefully coming will be able to be, st to be started sooner before much damage to the brain has occurred. So early detection is actually very important, but it's only, that's only as good as we have effective treatments to, be, to apply earlier on. And maybe some of the treatments we have already would be working better if we, could, uh, if we knew which people to give them to at an earlier stage. So those are the big issues. And I want to just talk briefly about each of them, including some of the things that we're doing at the University of Otago with Neurological Foundation support. So prevention, the delay. Um, you can think of the brain like a muscle. It's use it or lose it, baby. So you've got you've to keep your brain active. And keeping your brain active also means keeping physically active for a start. Um, so. Um, you don't have to go out and work out in the gym like these guys on the screen, all right? There's other ways to be active um, and um, mentally, physically, socially, and so forth. If, if you're a smoker, the single one, the one best thing you can do as a, uh, to kind of do this uh, prevention uh, treatment on yourself is to give up smoking. So. Um, you can take that home with you, but I suspect most of you probably aren't smokers anyway, so that's no help. Um, but there's all these other things you can do. Um, you have healthy diets, keeping your weight under control, which keeps your cardiovascular system, between those two, you keep your cardiovascular system healthier. What's good for your heart is good for your brain. 
um, physical exercise, gardening, going for walks, shopping, uh, playing golf, um, writing checks apparently, although we probably have to cha change that. Um, going, um, you know, going on the internet and checking your bank balance, I don't know. Um, but actually, you know, shopping, um, actually I, I just mentioned social connection. That's also very important. People get depressed if they get isolated. Uh, as they get older, if they lose the capacity, they, it's not uncommon for people to withdraw and become more isolated. And that is a negative feedback cycle that makes things worse and worse as well. Because uh, there's physiological effects of being isolated, being depressed, that makes the disease system and these processes worse as well. So um, shopping, let me tell you. I mean, I'm not, I don't never say this to my wife, but um, you, know, you usually stop off the cafe for a nice kind of healthy lunch and coffee. You're walking around, you're getting your exercise, you're checking out the, you're checking out the sales, you know, what is it better to shop, buy at this shop or that shop? You often do it socially. So that's what I'm talking about, keeping busy, keeping active, um, let alone learning new things. Okay, you could be signing up to learn new languages or guitar or singing or whatever. Um, so, and in fact, this is what is happening. There's several studies in Western societies don't have such a thing, don't have such a study in New Zealand. But the incidence, no, the prevalence of, of Alzheimer's disease is going down um, <clears throat> the, in the sense that if you look at, say, the 60 to 69 age group, the percentage of people who have Alzheimer's disease is less now than it was 20 years ago. But the total number of people in that category is bigger than it was 20 years ago. So the total number of people who have Alzheimer's disease in that category is higher. But there is some kind of self um, lifestyle modifications going on, probably better health system, better education. Every magazine you read tells you how you should be living your life better. Um, and so there's some you know, self therapy, self treatment going on that's probably delaying the onset of Alzheimer's disease. But of course, people are also living longer. So it just means eventually, probably, eventually those people, uh, a percentage of people will get it. So the idea by doing in this prevention delay then is to build up what we now, what we, many of us call in research land, um, cognitive reserve. That means that you could be getting Alzheimer's type pathology I was describing, those plaques and tangles and so forth, but you're able to resist those and still function well in spite of having the pathology. So the idea here is that uh, the, the, the kickover from normal uh, kind of cognition down across the line uh, into dementia um, happens more slowly and at a higher level of neuropathology for a person who has higher reserve. So if you have a healthier body, healthier brain, you have more reserve, it will take longer for this pathology to kick down into kind of dementia. So that's something that everyone can do. You don't need a doctor. I mean, you might take some advice from a doctor about like what is the sort of things you might should be doing or not doing, because it's not the same activities aren't the right for everyone. But um, you can, you can self-treat yourself by how you live your life. And it's never too late to start, OK? Um, it, will, it will help. So the idea is, uh, think about if uh, <coughs> rugby. Uh, you may or may not like this particular rugby player, Damien, but um, the whole idea here is, uh, what's the, what, it, what is it called in rugby? It's called a reserve bench. What's the point of reserve bench? The point of reserve bench is that as players get tired, you bring on fresh players who are just as good or just almost as good, and, you can, and the team can still perform at a high level for longer, all right? for the whole 90 min 80 minutes, 90 minutes, over time. Uh, eventually, things wear out, but you can perform for longer. So it's like a reserve bench for any sports team. Uh, and that's what we talk about, cognitive reserve. That's what we want. That's what you want as to help stave off um, the, the decline. OK, what about early detection? So as I mentioned, um, it's really, really hard to tell if a person actually has Alzheimer's disease. Your GP can't tell you. 
they can say, you're developing dementia. And th they would take a lot of testing to try to figure out what sort of dementia. And it can be important to know what's that, but um, it's very difficult to actually be sure that it's Alzheimer's disease. But what, as I mentioned, one of the things you can do these days now, particularly in, in research settings at least, is to do this kind of a brain scan called a PET scan. <coughs> If you know what that stands for, it's positron emission tomography. There you go. Write that down. Um, but what it does is uh, actually you inject a little bit of a very minute amount of radioactive tracer into the blood. It gets into the brain, and it binds into those plaques that have that amyloid protein I was telling you about. And then you can, then, um, a, you can have a detector that detects the emission of the radioactivity from those plaques, and you can see this in these red colors, a person with Alzheimer's disease has a lot of, captured a lot of that radioactivity in the plaques, and you get uh, an image of so much more uh, pathology compared to a normal um, patient, normal subject. So these kinds of PET scans can be done in New Zealand and are being used for research purposes, but it's not really the sort of thing that can be done on a scaled up to population basis. They're very expensive. The not many scanners um, and so forth. So, um, what else can we do? Well, there's a lot of work now to see if we can uh, um, develop a blood test for Alzheimer's disease. And there's groups all over the all over the world working on this. And I'm privileged to be part of a group, um, along with um, prof Associate Professor Joanna Williams um, and the team, uh, her team, Dan. Deanne uh, Grevemont and uh, Warren Tate, the neurologist Nick Cutfield, have been working on um, identifying in blood plasma uh, a typical type of molecule called microRNA. What's microRNA? It's a really small piece of RNA. <laughs> it's micro. Um, uh, I won't go into details. Um, it doesn't really matter in some senses, but um, one of the things about microRNA is that they are very stable in the blood so they don't get metabolized very fast. So um, they can be detected. And um, we've done studies with people with Alzheimer's disease and not Alzheimer's disease and people who don't have it but then get it and can follow the development and changes in the microRNA in the blood over time. And um, this work has been funded a lot by um, the Health Research Council but also by funding from their Logical Foundation and people who have donated to the University of Otago, actually, through the Foundation Trust. So if you're in any of those categories, we thank you for your support. And uh, we've, got, we've got a blood test. It's not commercially available yet, but it has a very good ability to detect people who have Alzheimer's disease and not assign Alzheimer's disease to people who don't have it. It's not perfect, uh, but it's as good, better than most other tests around. Other than now, there's a, a more recent one that's like really good, so maybe that will be the one. But we've got a provisional patent with the help of Otago Innovation, and we're looking for commercial partners in order to decide to kind of um, uh, expand and pursue this work, and hopefully um, at, one, at some point um, have it available for um, uh, you know, use in the general public domain. So not there yet, but um, we've been making, uh, I think, quite amazing progress in the years in which we've been working on this early detection idea. Okay, well, like I said, it's all very well to have early detection, but that's not much help unless you have actually use, uh, effective treatments to then give to people. So um, that has been the challenge for as long as we've known about Alzheimer's disease. And the question is, um, is it still all challenge or do we have new hopes? Um, what would make for a good treatment? Well, the list of uh, the wish list is pretty long. Well, first of all, it, we would like it to be effective. Bottom line, that would be nice. It would be nice if it was long lasting, so you didn't have to keep taking drugs and drugs, you know, every day or second day. Uh, you know, be nice if it was long lasting. It would be nice if you didn't have to put the drugs directly into the brain, that you could actually you know, take a pill or have an injection or something. Uh, but then you would like it to treat the whole brain, because Alzheimer's disease can affect the whole brain. So you don't trying to get it into one particular part. You're trying to basically get your treatment everywhere. 
So if you're, if you're not directing into the brain, you need to inject it, to get it into the periphery somehow. Um, and that means it has to cross the blood-brain barrier. So there's a very complicated system surrounding the brain that is there to keep out things that aren't supposed to be in there, like bacteria and viruses, um, but to let things in that should be in, like certain proteins, uh, amino acids, uh, glucose, and so forth. And of course, uh, we would like a, a treatment to have few, if any, side effects. And we'd like it to be affordable. So we're not asking much. <laughs> we just we want to want that. Uh, how hard can it be? Um, well, it actually is, is quite hard. Um, and so um, uh, there are drugs that are available um, that have been approved by the U.S. Federal Drug and Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, you may have heard of. Um, only one is approved for um, uh, it by Pharmac in New Zealand called Aricept. Um, and my father in the United States got Aricept in his later stages. It helps with cognition and kiss, keeps the symptoms you know, at bay a bit, but it doesn't stop the progression of, of the disease. So here we are in the lab. Yeah, we're working hard. Uh, we're all wearing lab coats. We're huddled over microscopes and test tubes and things. Uh, actually, I just got this off the internet as well. Um, but this is um, just to show you that there's, there is an, uh, there's an international effort in this. Like This is seen as one of the big issues in neurology, in health. And you might have heard some news in recent times about drugs, new drugs that have just been kind of released and some of which have been approved for use in Alzheimer's disease by the FDA. Aducanumab, lecanumab, donanumab. What are these MABs? These MABs, the MABs stand for monoclonal antibodies. So this is an antibody treatment. These are antibodies that bind to those amyloid proteins that get into the plaques. And the idea is that you use the antibodies like a sponge, and you sponge up the, the, um, uh, the, the, this amyloid protein, small protein or peptide, and um, then it can be cleared away with the waste and um, reduce the plaque load at least. Well, they've had a little bit of success in clearing plaque load, but not that much success with cognition. And some of them have had some very nasty side effects in significant portions of patients. So it's a small breakthrough, let's put it that way. It's giving some hope that we might be on the right way, but these drugs, you know, people say, well, how can I get hold of it? And I just tell people, first of all, it's not supported by Pharmac. I don't even know if it's available, any of these are available in New Zealand at all anyway. They'll be extremely expensive. They would have to be taken every few weeks, month maybe, and um, yet serve at severe risk of side effects. So, I, you know, I don't think we're there yet, and we need, we think we need other strategies. In, to be tried in addition to what the drug company is trying to do with these antibody therapies. So we need a new treatment idea, and who best to talk about new ideas? Our new researchers on the scene. So I'm going to turn the talk over now to my PhD student, Jim, who's working on a project that is um, currently funded by the Neurological Foundation. And um, over to you. How are we doing for time? Am I have I gone too long? No, perfect. I got a thumbs up. All right, so um, I'm going to turn it over to Jim to tell you about the story that we've got cooking um, in our lab uh, at Otago now. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Thank you for such a warm welcome. I'm really pleased to be here. So the um, treatments that Cliff was just talking about, they're talking, they try to remove um, the bad proteins, the amyloid plaques that are found in Alzheimer's disease that drive the disease. But we're taking a different approach, which is to try to increase the levels of a good protein. So this is a protein that's naturally occurring. You and I are making it in our brains right now. Um, and this protein, it can help to grow new neurons. It can help existing neurons to grow. And it can strengthen the connection between neurons and most importantly, it can improve memory. So 
The problem is we need to get this protein into the brain. So as Cliff was saying, the brain is surrounded by this filter called the blood-brain barrier, but, um, which is very effective at keeping bad things out. But we found a vehicle that might be able to get this protein into the brain. So we've chosen viruses. Now I know we've just come out of a pandemic, so it's not what you want to hear, but just hear me out, it's not COVID. <laughs> so viruses contain DNA, and the DNA is like a recipe that has all of the information to build all of the bits and bobs in the virus, and then how to put it together to make more viruses. So um, viruses are really good at getting this DNA recipe into the body. And then <coughs> our body reads the recipe and it actually makes more of the virus itself. So we're sort of harming ourselves by doing it. But we have taken this virus and we've removed all of the viral DNA and instead replaced it with a new DNA that will teach our body how to create this beneficial protein. So we'll be able to take this therapy and learn to produce more and more of this protein ourselves and fight Alzheimer's for a long time, rather than, as Cliff said, having to take, take a, a treatment um, constantly. So this is called viral gene therapy. Now, before we go and get this treatment and we just chuck it into people, we have to test it. Um, and so we've decided to use mice. Now, mice are fortunate because they actually don't develop Alzheimer's disease themselves, but these mice are unfortunate because they've been given genes from humans with genetic forms of Alzheimer's disease. So these mice actually develop the same amyloid plaques that drive Alzheimer's disease, and they get the same memory problems that we see in people. So we ran a few experiments to see whether this treatment will work. So first of all, we got this virus and we injected it directly into the hippocampus of these mice. So the hippocampus is a region of the brain um, involved in memory and learning, and it's especially damaged in Alzheimer's disease. So we then ran a few experiments. In, um, we first tested neurogenesis. So this is the creation of new cells. So all the time we're producing new cells in our brain. And you can take an area of the brain and you can count the number of new cells in it to see um, what the level of neurogenesis is. And in a healthy mouse, there will be a sort of baseline level. But in mice that have Alzheimer's disease, this um, um, rate of neurogenesis will be greatly reduced. But when we injected this virus into the brains of Alzheimer's mice, we were able to almost completely restore this rate of neurogenesis. So this treatment was able to um, improve the growth of new neurons. We then tested um, spatial memory. So uh, spatial memory is especially impaired in people with Alzheimer's disease. So um, this can often lead to people getting lost and going wandering and things like that. So we, we can test test spatial memory in a few ways in mice. So I'll show you one of these experiments. So this is a, a table that has holes around the perimeter. And if you put a mouse in the middle of this table and you shine a light over it, it will naturally want to escape. They hate that sort of thing. So they'll run around and look um, for an escape. And there are holes around the perimeter of the table. And under one of the holes, there is a little dark, cozy, mouse-sized box so it will naturally climb into the box. And if you put the mouse in the middle, it will sort of walk around, it won't really know where, where it's going, but eventually it will find this escape. But then if we run this trial over and over again, the mouse will find the quickest route to get to the um, box. And so you can measure the distance that the mouse travels over trials as a measure of its learning and memory. So um, here we have a graph where the blue dots along the top up here. These are Alzheimer's mice over several trials, and you can see that basically the distance that they've traveled to get to the escape is pretty much the same over all of the trials. Whereas both in healthy mice and in Alzheimer's mice that have received this treatment, over trials they get quicker and quicker. They find the most efficient path 
and they remember how to get to the escape much better. So this treatment that we've been using has been able to increase the growth of new neurons, but most importantly, improve the memory of these mice that have Alzheimer's disease. Um, but the problem with injections directly into the brain is that they're not really feasible in humans, and they're costly, and they're unsafe. And with a disease that has um, affects millions of people, it's not really realistic. So we needed to find a treatment that we can instead inject intravenously, so into the arm, and in mice, this is using tail vein injections. So the next uh, experiments that we did were we found a virus that could be injected into the tail and then get into the brain across this filter, this blood-brain barrier, and then treat the brain. So next, we studied the hippocampus directly. So this was that region involved in learning and memory that's really impaired in Alzheimer's disease. So here is a cross-section of the hippocampus where these green, um, green splotches on it are actually different amyloid plaques seen throughout the brain. So you can count the number or the density of these green stains to see what the level of these amyloid plaques are. And we can compare the number in Alzheimer's mice and in Alzheimer's mice that have received this treatment to see whether we're actually um, um, attacking the root cause of Alzheimer's disease, whether we can reduce the amyloid plaques. So, um, and again, we, we studied this virus using a tail vein injection. So that's a bit like intravenous injection in a human. Um, and so this plaque uh, number, it, in younger mice who are only six months old, um, there's a very small number of these plaques, whereas by nine months old, just like in humans, as the disease progresses, we get more and more of these plaques and um, they damage the brain more and more. However, in mice that we injected with this, this virus, this, uh, the number of these plaques was reduced significantly. So this was found both in the hippocampus, with, where learning and memory um, memories are formed, but also in other regions like the cerebral cortex. So this is the outer layer of the brain. So this treatment, again, it helped to grow new neurons, it helped their memory, but also it's helped reduce the number of these amyloid plaques, the real driving force of Alzheimer's disease. So it's looking hopeful. But unfortunately, this virus was then found, although we could inject it into the tails of mice and it would get into the brain, it was later found by another lab that it didn't work in monkeys. And that's really important because obviously if it doesn't get across in monkeys, it probably won't in humans. So we had to find a new virus. So we went back to the drawing board and we did eventually find one that we can inject into the tails of mice, but also intravenously in monkeys, and it does get into the brains, brain, bra into their brains. So here, this is where my um, project came in. So all of the experiments I showed you before, they were, um, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants here, but um, these are my ex little experiments. So I, um, again use this table um, maze where you put a mouse in the middle and it looks for an escape around the perimeter and over successive trials it will learn to escape more and more quickly. So I took a couple of videos of them which we used to record um, and so here there is a mouse in the middle and a little uh, box that the technicians at my department made and they built us a cool little lever that we can lift up so they're not getting scared by having a, a big human around it. So um, I'll show you this video. This is one of the first trials where a mouse, he doesn't really know what's going on, but um, he's, he knows that he wants to get out of there. But um, yeah, you can see he's sort of, sort of trial and error, you know. But eventually, he finds the escape hole. However, after um, a few more trials, he's already going in the correct direction, and then after one, two, and then three, he finds the hole. So you can see there's a, an improvement in, the, um, in the, the time or the distance to, uh, to find this escape hole. So, and you can see we can compare the relative time from the first trial to the last trial to see um, how much they've learned. So a greater reduction in the time, of course, means they've escaped quicker and they've learned better. And so again, in healthy mice, they, they have reduced 
their time by about 60% in the experiments that I did. Whereas in Alzheimer's mice, this is greatly reduced. So they only, imp they still improve, but no, oh, I don't know what's happened there. Oh, well, I think it's pretty much, you, you got the picture in here. Oh, here we go, yeah. So they, they still improve, but not as much as in healthy mice. Now, I'm still collecting data on the, um, the effect of the treatment, um, but I hope to bring that to you next time. But um, yeah, thank you. So that's my, um, that's my experiments there. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Jim. <coughs> so you can see it's a work in progress, um, but hopefully it does represent some progress. And it's a different approach than, than almost any other um, clinical trial that's going on, although there are some other groups trying to use these uh, viruses, which we like to think of as Trojan horses. Instead of, but instead of uh, the Trojan horse bringing extra attackers into the system like a virus normally does, you're bringing extra defenders to Troy to uh, help defend the brain. So um, with that, I would just like to um, conclude by saying, uh, the I think the Neurological Foundation has asked the question, is there a breakthrough? We're on the way, maybe, I think. And um, I think we're, we're on to something, and we just have to keep keep um, at the experiments to kind of get it to a point where it can go to a clinical trial. So here's the hope. More neuroprotective proteins in the brain will give br greater brain resilience to pathology. It give you more cognitive reserve. It could reduce pathology and at least delay symptoms for longer, um, adding what we'd say, adding life to years. Even if it doesn't make you live longer, you live better for longer is the idea. So with what you can do, and probably are doing, and what we can do, working together, we can reach that hallowed end of the tunnel in good shape um, and add life to years. And I just want to thank uh, our funders, uh, the Neurological Foundation, of course, uh, the Health Research Council, your tax dollars coming back to us through the Health Research Council, actually my tax dollars too, so I'm also self-funding. Um, if you uh, donate to Otago Medical Research Foundation, um, University of Otago Foundation Trust, Trust Brain Research New Zealand, I have a great team. Um, you can see these, um, these younger researchers are keeping me feeling young. I mean, this is, what, this is how it works. Um, and my colleagues here on the left. Um, and um, yeah, so that's our story. Um, hope it's been of interest. Uh, thank you for your attention. Um, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. <laughs> Namahi, thank you, Cliff. So now is your opportunity to quiz these gentlemen, get those curly questions up. And if you'd like to ask a question, just put your hand up. Hi, I have a question for you. The virus that you're designing, um, is there a possibility that the Alzheimer's could adapt to that virus and become resistant to it? Apologies if I'm offending. Yeah, so I don't know if everyone heard that question. The question is whether you would kind of adapt to the virus. Um, so this is a complicated story. I mean, you know, people get exposed to viruses, and you can develop antibodies to the viruses. I mean, this is what the vaccines, COVID vaccines, are all about, right? It's to kind of um, develop res immune responses to the viruses. The, in, in these experiments that we're doing, the mice get one treatment with the virus. The, the gene gets inserted into cells. The virus disappears. That virus shell, the capsid, uh, whatever, they, you know, the spike proteins, all those things, they're gone. And what's left is the, the gene inside cells. So you don't need to keep the virus around. The virus disappears. Um, the only problem is if you then have to do a redose, I mean, and we know that this effect can last for at least a year, probably much longer. So, but if, if in you actually in the end needed to have another dose, you, you may have an immune reaction that will attack the virus a second time around. So that's one of the potential limitations to this kind of treatment. Yeah. Kia ora, Cliff. Um, so, uh, my question is regarding the virus, how specific is it for the brain cells, or does it end up in the somatic cells elsewhere in the body? 
So um, this, uh, this virus is, um, it does get into both neurons and astrocytes um, in the brain. Um, and it was built through an evolution of um, several viruses. So it's come from a natural, naturally occurring virus um, called the AAV. And this virus, it does get into the brain, but it was also taken up strongly by the liver. And so which isn't a good, isn't a good thing. If your body, the liver detects viruses, it mounts an immune response and tries to destroy the virus, which in this case isn't good. Um, but through successive evolutions of the virus, this one actually does very strongly enter neurons, like 100 times or so greater than that original virus, and has very, very low levels of liver transduction. So it's barely picked up, um, and there's very little reaction to it. Um, yeah, yeah. And I might just add, um, since um, you, you sound like you know something about viruses and genes, just. Just to add to that, our, our um, latest application to the Health Research Council is to pursue this, but actually to have the DNA promoter specific for neurons to see if that, um, which will prevent it being expressed in um, other cells, even if it gets in there in the first place. So, um, so there's lots of bits and pieces to try out to optimize the, the process. Um, I'd like to know, is it possible that it is inherited? Can like it be passed from father to son or mother to daughter? Is it in a, a family inheritance type of thing or is it just something that happens out of the blue? Are you talking about the, uh, the disease or the, the disease. therapy? Yeah, Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's itself. disease, okay. So, um, yeah, it's interesting. There's, there's basically two broad classes of, of Alzheimer's disease, the genetic or familial forms and the ones that are not, <laughs> all the others. And there's only a few percent of, of Alzheimer's disease cases that are known to have a familial transmissible disease that can come down through um, generations. So it's mostly, the, and, and in those cases, they tend to be earlier onset, like people in their 50s, for example. But the later onset um, is typically not, so the, all the rest are some, for some other reasons. Um, there may be genes that give you more risk, and, there, and we know what some of them are. And we know that there's some genes that actually give you protection. And we know what some of them, that some, what some of them are. But um, even if you have the ones that give you risk, they don't necessarily give you the disease. So, it, so um, yeah. So the genetics is quite complicated. Um, but only a few percent are actually transmitted, you know, that are basically causative um, through, uh, through generations. Um, so preventing Alzheimer's, you can exercise and um, have a healthy lifestyle, but uh, can it reverse Alzheimer's? I haven't given the hard one. Um, uh, basically, how shall we put this? Um, if there's when there's damage, like when there's cell loss, okay, then that's not reversible. Jim spoke about you're being able to produce new neurons in the brain, but it's actually in very select places. Hippocampus is one of them. But um, uh, it, it would never be enough in the right places to replace the cells that have been lost. So, you know, if your hard drive gets, if your RAM is, you know, affected, there's no way to recover it, basically. You can reboot the computer all you like. Um, but if you have, but I talked about the neuroinflammation. I talked about, well, and there's some other things we've talked about that impair brain function without actually killing things off. Well, yes, the cognition decline that's based on, that's, that's resulting from that can be rescued. And basically that's what Jim's experiments that he talked about showed. By adding more of this protein into the brain, the, co the memory declines were reversed, okay? And, um, and they may or may not have changed the plaques even. Some experiments they did, some experiments they didn't. 
So uh, you can make the brain more resilient. So some of the symptoms can be reversed. The disease itself um, at the moment cannot be reversed as such, but you can improve on the symptoms. It would be nice, yes, to like, yeah, um, reverse the disease, kill it off altogether. I mean, that's the idea, right? You would just have, you know, it'd be like, you know, radiating the cancer cells and they're dead, right? But that's not, that's not an option currently in Alzheimer's disease world. Um, recently, and um, Australia, coming out of Australia, they were talking about dementia in children and teenagers. Sorry, uh, who's, who's speaking? Uh, Barbara. Oh, there you are. Okay. Sorry. Um, right. Yeah. Recently, coming yeah. out of the papers from Australia, they were talking about children have been diagnosed with dementia and also teenagers. Yeah. Are you seeing anything like that in New Zealand? Look, there, uh, as I mentioned, um, there are many causes of dementia. I can't honestly believe they have Alzheimer's disease at that early age. I mean, anything's possible in biology, but I uh, would think they have some other form of dementia. And there are many forms of childhood dementia. Um, Batten disease, for example. Um, others not, not coming to mind straight away. But um, so, uh, yes, dementia can happen early on, and you can have degenerative brain conditions early life and kids don't live past teenage years or early 20s. I mean, you know, this happens. Um, I don't know specifically what the Australian study is that you're referring to, um, but, I, yeah, but I would be surpri very surprised, but not saying it's impossible for this to happen much earlier in life than we, uh, that we normally understand it to occur. Normally, the biggest risk factor for Alzheimer's disease is age, right? So, it is for me, it's for a number of people in this group. Most people look quite young and healthy. <laughs> Most people look quite young and healthy here, but um, age is the biggest risk, risk factor. That's the, that's the standard story. It's not to say there can't be other causes. Um, so, um, yeah, I, don't, I can't really speak specifically to that study. I'm not familiar with it. Yeah. Hi, again. Oh, you're back. <laughs> Are there any other types of diseases or similar diseases that mimic or are similar to Alzheimer's for 50 plus age group? Do you want to go? I'll get to my point. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay, okay. I, 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 I got the ball passed. I'm the second five. The first five just gave it to me. <coughs> um, yes, um, many of the dementias are also aging related. Um, and so another Probably the second or third most common one is what's something called frontotemporal dementia, FTD. And um, so it is due to, interestingly, it has an, uh, an overlap with Alzheimer's disease. You may recall I mentioned these tangles in the nerve cells with the tau protein that becomes aggregated and insoluble. Well, FTD is characterized by such tangles, but they don't have the plaques. So they have um, a different kind of um, symptoms. Um, it still affects many of the same parts of the brain, like the hippocampus uh, in the, the fronto and temporal lobes of the, of the brain, which is why it's called frontotemporal dementia. Um, there are different forms of it. Um, Bruce Willis, you've probably been seen in the, in, the, um, you know, you know, in the news media and so forth. Bruce Willis, the actor, has one form of frontotemporal dementia, so there's an example. So um, there's, you can get dementia from Parkinson's disease, you get dementia from uh, Huntington's disease, and all these are aging-related disorders. Um, there's, you know, there's, someone said 700, was it 700 or 7,000, how many neurological disorders are there? But they're not all, neuro, they're all neurodegenerative, but um, so there are things like Alzheimer's disease, um, all these neurodegenerative diseases you might think of as actually examples of protein disorders. So I've talked about amyloid peptide forming plaques and tau protein aggregating. Parkinson's disease has a different protein called alpha-synuclein and it aggregates. So all these disorders are kind of like 
these proteins becoming abnormal in some way, they bind to each other, they keep binding, they aggregate more and more so that then the, the, um, the cleaning crew, these non-nerve cells like the astrocytes Jim mentioned and the microglia, can't get rid of them. And so uh, that is a, that's the common denominator for most of these neurodegenerative diseases. Their proteins are being accumulated inside cells that are toxic, that become toxic. Normal proteins, but then they become abnormal, aggregate, and become toxic as a result. Uh, yeah, thanks very much for the talk. Um, you've almost answered my question. It was just as what is the role in health for these proteins? That's what I was um, curious about the amyloid and the tau protein. Uh, yeah. Um, okay, am I still going? <laughs> I don't mind. Um, oh, yeah, I can do this. All right. Okay. Oh, I better step up for a little bit. <laughs> um, well, the amyloid beta that, um, is, that forms these plaques, that's the, um, the I amyloid beta is a protein that's produced by ourselves, our cells naturally in very small amounts. Um, but then in Alzheimer's disease, it is what um, then aggregates to form these amyloid plaques. But amyloid beta is um, necessary in, in um, normal um, life as well to, um, for the communication between neurons. Um, and the other protein that Cliff mentioned, tau protein, which then um, aggregates again um, to damage neurons, that is very important in um, transport along the cells. So it, it forms these long um, lines along the, um, the axons of the, the neurons, which are like the projections of the neurons, and it transports things back and forth. But then when it binds together with each other, um, as it does when it becomes abnormal, pathological, then it can no longer transport things and the, the cells begins to die. Hi. <laughs> um, this, this is out of curiosity. Um, well, maybe. Uh, with the mouse test, okay, for, for me, when I walk down the street, I'm like, oh, I'll turn left because there's the cabbage tree. I can notice that. I know because I remember turning left at the cabbage tree. But for the mouse, it went straight to the hole. And then all the holes look the same to me. How did that mouse know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> So what you couldn't see in the video, because uh, it was the okay. bird's eye, was that around the, the walls, there are these visual cues. Uh, so I went on Google, and I found like <laughs> striped lines, or dots, or waves, just random things that I thought were as different to each okay. other as possible. And so they're on the northeast, southwest um, okay. of, of, the, of the room. So I'm guessing that it looks at that, but it would also see the way that the lever comes up. Um, oh, wow. And who knows what else? Maybe it can even smell me in the same corner of the room, you know? Um, yeah. And so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, I think it can probably use all of these cues to um, to localize where, where the hole is. Yeah, yeah, what yeah. What kind of tests were used for the monkeys since we're so similar? Oh, I'm not sure, actually. Oh. Um. Uh, yeah, um, there are various memory tests uh, for monkeys, but I'm not familiar with like a spatial memory test that, that, um, that we've been talking about for mice. There are various memory tests um, uh, identifying uh, objects on a screen that, that are correct or go together, and you, know, you get different objects, and you have to remember these objects and so forth, um, and um, with different delays. So um, this is one of the things that, um, one of the things with Alzheimer's disease is that people can remember things for short periods of time while they're thinking about it, but then they have impairments in um, storing that away uh, for longer term use. So people sometimes talk about them having a short term memory problem. Actually, that's not correct. Pe un until it's qu quite severe, people generally have very good short term memory, like within the seconds or as long as they're thinking about something that's, that's been given to them. Um, what's impaired early on in the middle stages is the ability to store it away for, for in what we might call long-term memory. So it's actually a con what we call consolidation, memory consolidation or memory storage problem, not a short-term memory problem as such. Um, and this is why older memories are preserved because they've already been stored before you had the disease. So that that those cells that are storing that information are still there. And until you get to the late stage and you've lost so many cells, 
that then those older memories are impaired as well. Um, so I sort of rambled on from your question. I still don't know how monkeys are tested for spatial memory. So I, I don't know the answer to that, but I, I tried to distract you with this other information. <laughs> Maybe just clarify, Cliff, that that research didn't happen with primates in New Zealand. That was in an over, overseas lab. Oh yeah, there's no primate research in New Zealand. Um, even the development of these viruses that we talked about, um, we didn't make them, we didn't develop them, they were done overseas and then they're made available and we can, we can use, like I say, we, we're putting building, we're putting bricks in the wall, trying to you know, work together with other people around the world to kind of uh, make progress. Um, and so th these, these are good examples. Um, it turns out that the blood-brain barriers of different animal species are quite different. So what works in one animal doesn't necessarily work in another. So um, sorting that problem out is, you know, is, yet, is yet to be fully resolved. I go though again, viruses are being developed, virus shells that, that were uh, being developed that look like they can work more in uh, monkeys and, um, and humans. I was just curious, um, since the proteins in the brain are the problem, uh, should we eat less protein in our diets? Uh, no, I think uh, as a general rule, protein is quite good for you. Um, so, um, and you know, the because uh, for a start, um, proteins are made from what are called amino acids. You've probably heard of amino acids. You can go up and buy them. You can buy different ones off the shelf uh, in your pharmacies, and. Some amino acids cannot be made by the body, so you have to keep taking them in to be able to use to be make into proteins. So, um, so that's quite important. Um, you know, you won't be eating anything that will be giving you Alzheimer's disease. Okay, I, I, let me just assure you that, um, y of course, you can get diseases from, you know, bad meat or whatever. But basically. Um, ingesting protein is not the problem. The problem is that the brain, the brain's um, operations on those proteins have been changed in some way. And what's the what's the principal cause of Alzheimer's disease? What like what for those who don't have the genetic form? Why does it start? Does anyone know the answer? Because actually, no one really does. But what? But one of the one of the thoughts is that there's and why is it an aging related? risk factor is that blood flow to the brain becomes uh, s somewhat impaired. And that's, generally speaking, what happens during the aging, along with other things that are going downhill a bit. And as soon as you have reduced blood flow to the brain, then, then you know, um, that affects the operations, the molecular operations that need all the material coming in from the blood. And then things start going, um, ab working abnormally. So that's, that's a significant major theory for why things get started off in the first place. Um, it may, it, it's a strong hypothesis. It's not called as proof by any stretch. Um, but that's, that's one of the kind of major lines of thinking at the moment. That's why, again, what I said, what's good for the heart is good for the brain, because you want to keep that blood supply going as well as possible, um, even when you may have somewhat impaired blood flow um, to the brain, then if it's, as long as it's still kind of working strongly, the heart's working strongly, then you're pushing things out uh, in terms of a disease process. Someone else raised their hand that said they know what the cause of Alzheimer's disease is. Do you want to tell us? Yeah, I'll give it a shot. Um, let's call it another hypothesis. Uh, I've heard that it's related to chronic inflammation. So it's, I've heard that it's a trigger, I guess, for the maladapted. Um, it's a body's response to its perceived um, invasion, even though in this case, like for example, things like aluminium has been um, shown to promote um, Alzheimer's. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, of course, any of this, but what my question is related to that, so funnily enough, <laughs> it works out, um, is um, if you can briefly go into the mechanism of action of your, um, your neuroprotein, like is it is it, because um, you've mentioned it's neuroprotective and you've mentioned it's neurogenerative. So I'm wondering like, because then the third question that relates to that is, is, the, is there a possibility of a cocktail of these different mechanisms of action of, of target drugs that could work together? Like you said, to clear the plaques, 
to, um, to prevent new plaques and things like that. Okay, yeah, I prefer not to go into the molecular details, but we could talk about it afterwards if you like. Um, but polytherapy is certainly on the cards, I think, and because um, at the moment we're still not close to a, a one treatment does everything kind of approach. Even for the existing drugs, they often pair two of them together. I'm not sure often is the right word. But it, it is being done to pair two of them together because they have different mechanisms of action to try to get benefit from having two instead of just one. So what we might call polytherapy is, is definitely on the cards. Um, I want to come back to inflammation because we've been talking about the brain this whole time and the heart. But um, we're a body system. And our brains aren't like the Richard Nixon head in the in the kind of cylinder. What was that? What was that show? Um, what's that? No, not not the Simpsons. The other one. Um, but anyway, uh, we're not just like an isolated brain. We're part of a body system, and there's plenty of communication back and forth from the brain to the body. Of course, I mean we move for a start, right? And we have our sensations, but also uh, the internal organs are constantly talking to the to the brain as well and circulating. So if you have inflammation in the body, that can affect what the brain is doing. So, um, you know, diabetes, obesity, they sound like body conditions. There's brain inflammation going on in conjunction with that because they're talking to each other. So um, I'm not sure that chronic inflammation is a um, cause of the disease but it is certainly an aggregating, aggravating factor, for sure. So um, again, healthy body helps delay um, onset. Um, and these, these inflammation works both ways. Immune cells can actually enter the brain from the blood and, you know, um, yeah. So yeah, inflammation is definitely a factor, but I, I'm not sure that we would say it's a cause at this stage. There was a question earlier about um, familial, perhaps a familial cause. Could you um, uh, answer whether there's any relationship to head injury cr um, for development of Alzheimer's? <coughs> That's an extremely topical question. Um, I think everyone would agree. Um, we hear it a lot about um, you know, contact sports, um, head injuries, repeated head, head injuries, um, and um, the long-term effects of that, um, CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Um, yeah, I think anecdotally there's strong links. The research showing that the way in which that works and to what extent and how much is still happening, still to come. Because Alzheimer's disease is so common, right, um, to show that the, the commonality is actually increased in people that have had chronic injury takes long-term studies and lots of people in order to make safe conclusions on a population basis. Nonetheless, the, um, the, anecdotal, the anecdotal information, you know, would suggest strongly that it's not a good idea. So when I came off my bike doing the epic around Lake Hawea and got helicoptered out because I, I hit my head, um, an interesting period of unconsciousness and, and re-consciousness that is just what I was teaching my students, so that was it's a useful anecdote. Um, I'm now in the process of selling my bike because of my age and deciding that probably doing the epic is no longer uh, on the cards for me. Just, just as a, I mean, actually it's my wife telling me this to be honest, but, <laughs> but uh, uh, just to be clear, but, um, but I'm selling the bike. So, um, but it, I, I'm aware that, you know, we, I don't want to take the risk with repeated head injury. And, and probably it's the case with rugby players, soccer players who were using those old leather balls that would get wet and heading them all the time and so forth. Um, uh, yeah. Um, but don't take it like as proof positive because I'm saying this. I'm just saying that, I mean, it, it's almost 
certain, but the actual research to prove it is still coming along. Well, one thing for sure is our brains are healthier for being here this evening. So thank you so much. Our pleasure. <laughs> I know some of you missed out. I saw a few hands going up at the last minute. But the good news is uh, Cliff and Jim are going to be here to have some kai and a cup of tea. So please stay around for those of you who are new, and there's many of you, which is wonderful. If you feel inspired by uh, what's happening in Accelerating Science to help our loved ones, then please take home one of these on the table. It's got the opportunity for you to make a koha, a donation, to help continue this incredible work, which is only possible to thanks to you. So thank you. Wonderful to meet you all, and I look forward to connecting with you in the future. Kakite.